All right, I'm going to um, do a short story called, uh, Hey, Jerry! The cyclone was looming on the horizon, waiting. I could see it in the distance. I could hear the screams. People were being chewed up and spit back out onto the hard pavement below. All my life I'd heard stories. When I was growing up, I knew it was always there, two blocks from my building, waiting for me. I made a vow to God very early on that you couldn't even drag me on that prehistoric roaring monster on the verge of collapsing at any moment. When I was 13 years old, they dragged me. With complete disregard for my vow. 13 years old. The age, the rabbis told us, when you become a man. I tried to escape, but once you're in, the only way out is to get to the other side. Unless you want to humiliate yourself by squeezing back through the long line of people behind you to exit through the entrance. I wanted to humiliate myself, but they wouldn't let me. The next thing I knew, I was in the seat. They lowered the bar. They locked the lock. They pulled the lever. No, this isn't happening. This, this isn't real. I, I'm going to wake up right when we get to the top and see that it was all just a bad dream. The smell of the old wood withering away in the salt water air was leaving splinters in my pounding heart. As we slowly ascended that first and highest hill, all the other rides below turning into little toys as we clanked closer and closer to the almost 90 degree angle drop waiting for us over the edge. Help! I'm being kidnapped! I don't think I can survive the feeling of my stomach shooting up to my face. Oh my God, please help me, God. I'm too young to die. How can you let this happen? I'm just a 13-year-old boy! Is this really locked? It better be locked. There's no turning back now. I can't believe that this is happening. Why, God? Why? I know. I know. I'm a no good, good for nothing, non-believer who quit Hebrew school at nine years old only one and a half weeks after I started, but at least I eventually wound up getting a half Torah tutor once a week, and then finally went through with the bar mitzvah. You gotta give me that! What? I did it? I did it? I did it! I was down the hill going up the next one, and I was alive! I was still alive! And I was laughing, louder than anyone else, even God. The feeling of my stomach going up from going down such a steep hill wasn't as bad as I thought. I mean, it was bad, but kind of in a good way, like like falling from the sky in a dream and as you're about to hit the ground, waking yourself up just in time to save your life. And as that, as we went up, as my stomach went up from going down each successive hill, that feeling started to be more and more of a thrill. And the laughter got faster and faster with each violent turn slamming into each other harder and harder. And then the ride was over. What? That's it? <laughs> I want to ride again. <laughs> so we had gotten on for free, because when we were waiting in line, Artie Weinberger yelled out, Hey, Jerry, can we get on one time for free? See, Artie learned to do that when his friend Louis Pinto did that and got him on for free. And Louis Pinto learned to do that when his friend Hector Rivera did that and got him on for free. And Hector Rivera learned to do that when his friend Sammy Says So did that and got him on for free. And Sammy Says So didn't learn it from anyone. He invented it. He was friends with Jerry. Pinto, Rivera, and Says So were thugs from 16th Street, the wrong side of the Stillwell Avenue station tracks. Jerry was Jerry Mendito, <laughs> operations manager of the cyclone. We thought he was the godfather. <laughs> I told my friend Frankie from my building about it, and we decided it was our turn to be Jerry's friends. So the next day, we snuck past the ticket booth, waited in line, and yelled out over the chatter of the other people waiting and the screeching screams of the riders and deafening rattle of the roller coaster cars careening across the ancient rickety wooden tracks right above our heads. Hey, Jerry, could we get on one time for free? Please? On the other side of the cyclone's only stretch of horizontal tracks, Jerry sat there at his desk next to the big red and yellow lever that set the whole thing in motion every two minutes with his, with his broad but slightly slouching shoulders, his dapper comb-back silver hair, and his jutting Brando jaw. He eyed us dubiously like the guardian of the gates to the holy mountain that he was. St. Peter in a t-shirt up on his folding chair thrown as we poured on the poor, innocent, ride-deprived local kids with no money look until he finally gave a very slight head nod toward the first U-turn bend in the tracks that led to the ascension. It worked. <laughs> we were in. 
anointed, <laughs> blessed. Frankie and I furtively smirked at each other, then quickly looked away. As we waited to board, the smell of the old wood didn't taunt me like it used to. This time, it tantalized me, and I, I felt a tingling throughout my body. And there it was, the last car, hungry for our bones. <laughs> Fortunately, someone else's bones had reserved the last car first, so we got into the front car. A little less violent, but more death-defying to the eyes. When the ride was over two minutes later, we got up and wobbled back out onto the street. We felt sexy and dangerous. We turned the corner in our lives. Anything was possible. We were young and free with our futures in front of us. Hey, Jerry, can we get on one time for free? Just one ride? Please? Every other day. Jerry! At first, we were amazed each time he gave us the nod, but after a while, we began to feel a sense of entitlement. Of course he's letting us on. It's us. The boys from Luna Park. The lunatics. <laughs> we started getting our friends on, and one time I even got my older brothers and my older cousins visiting from Teaneck, New Jersey on. I felt proud, powerful, a guy who can make things happen, a neighborhood mover and shaker, the Coney Island kid, connected, tight with Jerry. <laughs> It was time for Frankie and me to expand our operation, branch out a bit. We decided to start going around to the other rides and telling them, Jerry from the Cyclone asked if we could please get on one time for free. Hey, we knew what an important person he was, so it had to work. And, and anyway, his, his nod was becoming more and more subtle, almost imperceptible, which confirmed that he was so crazy about us, he, he didn't even have to nod anymore. He just understood. For the next week, the two of us hit every twisting, whipping, dropping, bopping, thumping, bumping, flying, upside down, riding Coney Island, from the El Dorado disco bumper cars on the south side of Surf Avenue to the early 1900s antique organ playing B&B carousel on the north side of Surf Avenue to the Enterprise and Music Express in Astroland to the Scrambler Spookorama and Wonder Wheel on Jones Walk to the smoke-spitting Dragon's Cave on the Bowery right next to Schweikert's Walk where the bobsled used to be before the bulldozers came to the deceptively terrifying wild mouse on West 12th Street, to the, to the resplendently decrepit Thunderbolt roller coaster, defiantly still running, the lonely wooden house over which it was built, mysteriously still inhabited, big dogs inside the buildings, in, in, big dogs inside the window, barking at the boardwalk to the patient amusement of its towering next door neighbor, the parachute jump, which we would have tried to get on too if it wasn't for the fact that the parachute jump had been closed down for as long as I could remember. Our friends didn't recognize us anymore. We walked around with our bodies slightly slanted, our heads slightly tilted, a faraway look in our eyes, and our faces frozen in a giant teeth-bearing ear-to-ear grin, just like the exalted but forgotten funny face of Steeplechase the Funny Place, which had watched over Coney Island for 61 years until real estate baron Fred C. Trump and his cronies held a brick-throwing party one month before my first birthday, smashing it in and tearing it down before we ever had a chance to see it. One day, after we'd gotten on the water flume for free, we were sticky with summer heat and humidity and needed another cold splash as we, right away as we made our daily rounds. Although we were hesitant about hitting the same ride two days in a row, we figured the the water flume guy would be too hot and tired to bother to wonder. We said, Jerry from the Cyclone asked if we could please get on one time for free, just as we said the day before. <laughs> but the heat didn't cause him to be a pushover. It caused him to be cranky, <laughs> cost conscious, <laughs> suspicious. <laughs> Wait a second, he said in his seething Brooklyn accent. Then he picked up the phone and started dialing. Oh. <laughs> Frankie and I looked at each other nervously. Was he calling the cops? Should we run? The man mumbled something into the phone, listened, mumbled again, then hung up. And with glaring eyes hitting us harder than the rays of the relentless sun, he said, Jerry wants to see you at the cyclone right away. <laughs> All we had to do was go hide under the boardwalk for a bit, mix in with the crowd on the beach, cool off with a jump in the ocean, make a quick stop at Philip's old-fashioned candy store and scrounge in our pockets for enough change to chip in for 
uh, one last chocolate egg cream with two straws and one final chocolate covered frozen banana with crunchies, then go straight home, lay low for a while, never try to get any more free rides, and in time, the whole thing would blow over. We didn't have to go face Jerry at all. But we thought that as soon as Jerry sees it's us, he'd say, oh, it's you. <laughs> Why me say so? <laughs> All right. I'll call him back and tell him to let you on the water flume right away. We went right back to the cyclone. Imperiously marched past, marched past the ticket booth man and, and pushed our way to the front of the line as older kids grumbled, Hey punks, what do you think you're doing? Jerry wants to see us, we shot back. So move aside. <laughs> And there he was, sitting at his desk like Vito Corleone in his office during his daughter's wedding, taking last requests and granting favors. I had an urge to say, Godfather, may your daughter's first child be a masculine child. But instead, we just stood there staring at him until he noticed us. I was hoping he'd just nod as usual. I'd never heard him speak before. This time he didn't nod. He spoke. Who the hell are you? I don't even know who you are! We're Sammy Sesso's friends. Sammy who? Sesso. Oh. Sesso. Yeah. Who the hell is he? <laughs> I don't know no says so. How dare you use my name to run a con game all over Coney Island? He's got a lot of nerve, you know that? Who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> Sweat was pouring uncontrollably down my face, burning my eyes, but I didn't dare move a muscle to wipe it off as Jerry unleashed his wrath upon us in front of all those innocent people waiting to ride the cyclone. <laughs> and Frankie and I prepared to die. <laughs> Get the hell out of here. I don't ever want to see your faces again! Everyone stared as we lowered our heads, squeezed our way back through the painful gauntlet of gangsters we had just cut on line, <laughs> went back past the ticket booth man without daring to look up at him, and exited through the entrance. <laughs> banished. We'd been banished. Still alive. But banned, banned for life. Frankie and I crossed Surf Avenue back to Luna Park and walked slowly up West 8th Street in total silence. When we got back to our building, we walked up the staircase to the second floor where Frankie lived. But before he got out to go to his door, we finally glanced in each other's eyes. And for a second, with a sudden fluttering of our lips out of their stunned horizontal straightness, the corners turning back up, almost imperceptibly, not into a smirk or a giant grin, but into the tentative beginnings of a simple smile. We shared something secret, something profound. We knew we knew something new, but we didn't know what it was, just that it was different. And then we said something. Our first words since our banishment. See ya. Yeah. See ya. Oh, wow. <laughs> 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 right, one minute left, so I'll do a one minute poem. Um, <laughs> it's called The Under Talker. Um, <laughs> what will happen to us now that they took away under the boardwalk? We won't be falling in love under the boardwalk, boardwalk. I heard that pushing the sand right up under the boards like that is what causes them to erode and crack. 
Did you? I wish we could have our down by the sea on a blanket with my baby under the boardwalk back. Did you hear that when they filled it in, homeless John the Undertalker was buried alive under the boardwalk? Yesterday I tripped on a broken board and fell on my ear, and I swear while I was there, I could still hear him talk. If you listen closely, you can still hear him talk. You know that guy Len, who lives in Luna Park and works on Jones Walk? One day, without warning, from behind the counter, he handed me a perfectly working wristwatch with a warm smile just to be friendly. But then one night, without warning, he yelled at me like a lunatic, unleashing all his layers of compacted paranoia just because he thought I was shooting some video footage of him behind the counter with my camera. Well, he was wrong. It was my brother's camera. <laughs> You know, Lenny, with his sucker-seducing, dollar-devouring, almost impossible, no-scam game of desperation, zen-like steadiness, focus, fun, and skill, and his coveted, beloved dancing lady, 25 cents to fall in love for a minute before she suddenly returns to her, haunted, staring, and standing still, and for a quarter, his puppet show in a window, and his miniature Coney Island in a glass display case, patiently waiting for a coin to slide through its thirsty slot in the salty place. He told me that he was one of the kids whom the sailors would pay to watch out for the cops while the sailors had their way under the boardwalk. Boardwalk. And then when I watched Len caress the air with his saintly sad clown smile and his zany, his zany midway spiel, I could hear the organ grinding hunger to take you there under the boardwalk where I buried all the loneliness I feel. Thank you.